Welcome, thank you for joining us this evening for the, this talk with Titus Kafar. My name is Mitra Abbaspur, and it is my honor to be here as a representative of the Art Museum to celebrate our role as a campus partner in the Princeton and Slavery Initiative. Titus Kafar's work forms the core of Princeton University Art Museum's representation in this important initiative. His monumental sculpture, Impressions of Liberty, is installed in front of McLean House across from Palmer Square in the heart of the historic Princeton University campus. If you haven't had a chance to see it in person yet, it comes alive at dusk, and I urge you to make a scenic route up to Nassau and around the sculpture on your way to the art museum after this talk. His work is also featured in the exhibition, Making History Visible, that is in the museum galleries now, where it is in conversation with works from the American collection and the modern and contemporary collection of, the art, of, the, of Princeton University. Beginning four years ago, as a discussion in the classroom of history professor Martha Sandweiss, the Princeton Slavery Re Research Initiative examines the ties of the university to slavery by gathering together archival sources and scholarly perspectives with the intertwined goals of expanding what we know about the past and fostering discussions about how this knowledge shapes our present values, culture, and identity as the Princeton University community. I begin thusly by expressing enormous gratitude to Professor Martha Sandweiss, University Archivist Dan Link, and the entire extraordinary Princeton and Slavery Project team for not only creating the space for this important conversation, but for reaching out to ensure that voices from across the humanities, the campus, and the community were engaged as contributors. Undertaking an examination of one's institutional involvement in the economy of slavery demands both seriousness and sensitivity of commitment. A serious and sen seriousness and sensitivity and a commitment that acknowledges the weight and the complication of the subject. For this commitment, I additionally thank the leadership of the Art Museum, Director James Stewart, the leaders of the teams of collections and exhibitions, education, publications, development, operations, and information technology, truly, nearly every member of the Art Museum staff was involved in some way in realizing this ambitious installation and related exhibition and programs. Two groups, however, require a particular acknowledgement. Firstly, the stellar team of art preparators who went above and beyond to lend their expertise throughout both the development and installation stages of this project. And essentially, Lisa Arcamano and the manager, the manager of Campus Art and all the cast and crew of the Office of Design and Construction who navigated the logistics large and small to ensure the success of this endeavor. Titus's commission, Impressions of Liberty, received vital support from the Kathleen C. Sherrod Fund for Acquisitions in American Art, the David A. Gardner Class of 1969 Magic Project in the, in the Council of the Humanities, and in addition to the generous support of the above for the exhibition Making History Visible and related programming, support comes from the Princeton Histories Fund, the Center for the Study of Religion, the Program in American Studies, and the Department of African American Studies here at Princeton University. The great force of history, James Baldwin writes, comes from the fact that we carry it within us, are unconsciously controlled by it in many ways, and history is literally present in all that we do. It could scarcely be otherwise, since it is to history that we owe our frames of reference, our identities, and our aspirations. We gather here tonight to welcome to Princeton an artist whose work wrestles with the full force of history, that wades deeply into its languages and traditions to chart a course for the future. Titus Kafar was born in Michigan, received his BFA at San Jose State University in California, and earned an MFA from Yale University. 
He continues to live and work in New Haven, where he is the co-founder of Postmasters, a community arts initiative that mentors, supports, and creates space for developing talent. In addition to a steady stream of solo and group exhibitions, Titus has been the recipient of grants from the California Arts Council, the Bell Arts Foundation, the Gwendolyn Knight and Jacob Lawrence Fellowship, and a Creative Capital Award. This year, he was a guest speaker at the TED Conference, a performance that you can hear on TED Radio or stream online. Uh, his work is held in multiple museum collections throughout the United States, and we are very proud that the list now includes the collection of the Princeton University Art Museum. If, after his talk tonight, I invite you to join us for a reception at the Art Museum Galleries, where the exhibition uh, includes additional works by Titus, uh, placed into conversation with works from the Art Museum's collection. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Titus Kafar. All right, cool. Yeah, hey. <laughs> I'm gonna start this thing the same way I always do, uh, which is to say, I don't really like doing these things. <laughs> uh, I apologize, but it's true. Um, you would think after having done a TED Talk and all that other stuff that I'd be used to it, I'd be comfortable up here. I'm not, and I don't know that I ever will be, um, but I have this opportunity to speak to you today, so I'm gonna nervously sort of trudge my way through it. Is that all right? All right. It's supposed to be something up here. There we go. All right. So I'm just going to talk about my work in general a little bit, and then we'll come on to this piece that I did for Princeton and uh, end with the project I'm working on in New Haven, which is called the Postmasters Project. Um, so, I came into painting really, really, really late. Um, I was about 27 years old when I made my first painting. Um, I discovered painting sort of accidentally, and anybody who's heard the TED Talk uh, uh, knows that to be true. I, I, long story short, um, there was an amazing woman who's sitting over there who became my wife, who I wanted to impress. Um, and, and, and so I registered for some, some classes at a junior college to do so. Um, and I randomly registered for some art history classes. Um, got into those art history classes and discovered that I had a kind of visual intelligence that I never knew that I had. Now that was surprising for me because my GPA in high school was 0.65. <laughs> Decimal point first. 6-5, right? So that basically means I pretty much failed at everything. So the idea that I had any kind of intelligence was utterly shocking, right? And so what, what happened was the professor would put up these images on the screen and, and need me to remember things based on how they looked. I, somehow that worked for me. And when I discovered that that was kind of the way in which I saw the world, it gave me a language to be able to engage that world for the first time. And so once I started painting, I kind of never left it. I kind of never walked away from it. Um, and this right, right here, what you're looking at, is a, a body of work called Visual Quotations. And this series of work uh, was the work that actually got me into Yale. Now, um, I'd like to say that I applied to Yale and got rejected from them. Um, and then I applied again and got rejected from them. And then at that point, I decided, y'all just going to re reject me for the rest of my life because I'm going to just keep applying until somebody lets me in or just get tired of hearing from me. And on the third time, I finally got in. And as I look back at my work before, I realized I really just wasn't ready. The work wasn't ready then. Um, but I found this body of work. And this body of work evolved from taking another art history class. I was in one of those survey art history classes. Um, we all know them where they try to tell you way too much information in one class. You start with cave paintings. And you, at the end of it, you're looking at Jackson Pollock. And it's just way too much information, not very well curated, way too much information in one class. But we try to do it. It's 
it's a survey, that's what it's for. Well, I looked at the book at the beginning of that class, at the beginning of the semester, and realized that inside of this survey of art history, there was one tiny little section that talked about black people in painting. Now, it was not a very well curated section because it was, it was painting that black people made, paintings that had black people in it, and probably someone who was a friend of the author who was black as well. I mean, <laughs> it was the most poorly curated chapter you could possibly imagine, but it was there. And the fact that it was there excited me. It made me feel like, okay, all right, I haven't had this in any of my other art history classes, so let me, let me just look on and, and see what we get. To my surprise, when we got to that chapter, the professor told me that we were gonna be skipping over that chapter and that we didn't have time to go through it. Being the only black person in the class, I raised my hand and I said, excuse me, professor, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. I don't mean to disturb you right now, but I'm just curious, when are we gonna get back to this chapter? Because I'm particularly interested in it. And she said to me, Titus, we don't have time to do this right now. I said, oh, sorry, sorry, last time, last time. So when will we have time to talk about it? Because I really, really need to talk to you about this. And she said, well, meet me in my office hours. Went to her office hours, we talked for a while, I got kicked out of her office, it's a really long story. Anyway, I left, I went to the dean's office, I went to talk to the dean, and the dean finally said to me, Titus, I can't make her teach anything. And in that moment, what I realized was if I wanted to know this history, if I wanted this information, I was gonna have to seek it out myself. I was gonna have to find my own books, I was gonna have to find my own teachers, and that was the only way I was gonna be able to engage this information. And so I started this body of work, which started focused on that classroom. This is a series of works that we're looking at some of the paintings in that chapter, and they're all done on dry erase whiteboard. Um, they're done on dry erase whiteboard because that was what was in front of the class. It's the first time I started thinking about materials conceptually. Everything that was a painting didn't need to be on canvas, and so, I, I essentially erased everything else from the composition except for these black figures that were floating in that space, giving the viewer the opportunity, hopefully, to kind of think about what was going on for them for the first time. So, um, as I'm looking at these images over and over again and thinking about the kinds of representations that exist of black people in the history of painting, there is this reoccurring theme in slavery, in servitude, or impoverished. These are the depictions of black people in the history of Western art. Now, are there other things? Yes, but primarily these are the representations that I was seeing over and over and over again. I started trying to think about ways to engage the history that was being represented here, engage the history that I was so frustrated about not learning fully and specifically its relationship to our history, and I started asking myself the question, why, does, why um, does this painting, when I'm talking about, for example, torturing a painting, why am I talking about painting torture as opposed to the question, what is the effect of torturing the painting? Like what, and once that question came to me, it, it changed everything about the way I started looking at art, about my work in particular. It made me think about the physicality of the object itself, which guided me and took me to a bunch of different places that I never really expected to go. So all of this work that, I, that I've been making that's looking at these histories that are trying to find these black characters, these figures, and try to decipher the narratives, one of the things that's coming up a lot is no matter how much I want to find the stories of these people, by and large, they don't exist. They weren't recorded. Um, and what happens is because you know the, these folks are not the ones who are commissioning the paintings, we're not recording those histories in the same way. We get lucky every once in a while when when a one of our one of our founding fathers, a president or a, 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 a highly esteemed individual, has enslaved another individual. Then sometimes our, that history gets uh, told down to us, but often, most of the time, it's not. This was a painting that I did um, after being asked to be a part of a discussion about the founder of Yale. Not the founder, in fact, but the man for whom the university was named after. Yale has this painting um, of this man uh, signing a document, and there are all these figures there, and in the background there's this little black boy. And my first question was, who is that? Who's he? What's his name? What were his dreams? Does anybody have any idea what was going on for him? 
And again and again, the refrain is, no, nobody has any clue what's going on for him. So I, I begin to sort of imagine these histories and try to think about, you know, what is this child's name and what did this person want? And, and as I was in the studio reworking the painting, I decided that I really wanted to find a way to express that there were other folks here, but right now, we're not talking about them. We're talking about this individual here. And so I actually took the canvas and then crushed the canvas. This painting, uh, before being crushed, is about 10 feet by 10 feet. Um, it gets crushed and then just stuck a frame right on the little boy in the center of the painting. Now the challenge with doing this kind of thing, with this particular kind of work, is that most of the representations of black folks in these paintings are burlesque, they're caricatures, they're not people, they're not supposed to be people, they're supposed to be a representation of the wealth that the other folks in the composition have. That's what they're supposed to represent. So many of the times when I go back to trying to make these images, I actually have to have people sit for me so that I can, I can paint someone who looks like someone. In many cases, it's very clear that the folks who are making this painting, either their skill level or their talent, just turns off when they get to painting um, black folks in the painting. It, there's, there are cases where, in fact, there are cases where the, quote, master painter is not the one who's actually painting those paintings. Their assistant sometimes is painting those images as well. By the way, there's another thing that I normally say uh, at the beginning that I forgot to say, um, and it's just something that helps me feel comfortable. If you guys have a question, you can just shout it out. We can make this more like a conversation. That would be really, really helpful to me. So if at any point you have a question about anything, raise your hand and we'll go from there. Cool? So I make this work, and I make it because I feel compelled to make it. Um, fundamentally, everything that I do is personal. Um, there's some experience I've had in the classroom, some conversation I've had that draws me into the studio. What I realize about my practice right now is my practice is the place, my studio is the place where I wrestle with history, where I try to figure things out for myself. I need to, I need to sort of make something to understand something. And so this painting sort of emerged from a conversation um, that I was having with a woman who taught history for many years. And uh, let me start by saying, I adore this person. I really, really adore her. She taught history for years and years and years. And we were talking about American history and we sort of like got onto the topic of Jefferson and then we got onto the topic of slavery. And I was excited to have the conversation. But at some point in the conversation, she said, yes, he owned slaves, but Jefferson was a benevolent slave owner. And, and, I, and I said in that moment, I truly don't know what that means. I, I, you have to explain that to me because I've never heard anyone being called a, a benevolent kidnapper, a benevolent rapist. Um, I've never heard that. And if you were truly benevolent, if you were truly benevolent in a country that values liberty at the level that we value liberty, then the only benevolent thing to do is to give that person their liberty. That's it. So I don't understand what you mean by that. And I wasn't aggressive about it. I just wanted to have the conversation. And to my surprise, she didn't want to have a conversation. She didn't want to say anything about it. And so I sat there for a couple of minutes before I realized that it was going to go nowhere. And then I finally got up and I left. I went to the studio and I started working on this piece. I didn't know that this was what was going to happen. But this is the painting that emerged, titled Behind the Myth of Benevolence. And this is a depiction of Jefferson and uh, uh, Sally Mae Hemings. Obviously, we don't have a photograph of it. This is a, this is a model. Um, so, I mean, every painting is, is really, really different for me. Um, sometimes I make a painting and the painting comes really quickly, um, but the painting will sit in my studio for a month before I know exactly what's supposed to happen. I, I try not to over plan what's going to happen with the painting. I try to just make the thing and wait for the thing to sort of direct me towards a particular end. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Almost white. Yep. To make it absolutely clear. To make it absolutely clear. Do you know Carrie James Marshall's work? Mm -hmm. 
So in Kerry James Marshall's work, oftentimes when Kerry James is representing black people, there's a, you know, a variety, a, a sort of uh, uh, um, just array of values of black skin. Um, but because I'm functioning visually, and I'm not there to have the conversation with someone after they leave, I need it to be understood exactly what I'm trying to say. And that was more for me as, uh, than it was for trying to, um, uh, it was for me trying to communicate it visually, clearly. Yeah, that's what it's about. So, and then in other cases, we have, we have these really interesting histories. We find out a little bit more of the histories of some of these folks who were enslaved by these different, these different um, presidents. Um, these, these are two representations of that. Um, Ona Judge, who I'm sure many of you have read about recently, um, this individual who was enslaved um, by George Washington, who just, you know, after spending some time in Philadelphia and seeing free black people was enamored, captured by this idea of liberty and decided that she was gonna run away. She ran away, she escaped, she, and she, she the end of the story is that she died, um, she died free. She didn't die, she didn't die wealthy. Um, she struggled, but she died free. Um, these, this representation on, on the screen right here, what you see is, um, oil painting, and then on the skin, it's actually um, tar on the surface. And I've been using tar as a material for a really long time. A lot of times people are like trying to find a way in which the tar always has a, the same kind of symbolic meaning in every single painting, and it really doesn't for me. It started to when I first started making paintings using the material, but then very quickly I felt like I wanted this material to do other things, to say other things. Yeah? How do you make the tar? A palette knife. Palette knife. It, it functions very similar to, um, very, uh, to oil paint in that it, it's a sort of oil-based material. You can, you can thin it out with, um, with uh, turpentine or linseed oil. Um, you can use it in the same way. As a matter of fact, um, as a matter of fact, the material in the tar itself, uh, asphaltum, is used in other paints, just not to the degree that it's used in, in tar. So as I said, all of these paintings, all of, all of my work um, has some very, very personal, personal connection to it. Even, even when it seems historically distant, um, there is something that has brought me to the space of dealing with, uh, dealing with those ideas in that particular image. This is a body of work that led <laughs> to the Jerome Project, really. Um, the Jerome Project is an investigation into the criminal justice system um, based on my father's name, um, and my father's name is Jerome. Um, I'm not going to talk too much about that. I, I, I'm not going to talk too much about that. Um, but what I do want to say is it's that body of work that the uh, director for, the Time Mag for Time Magazine came in and saw in a museum and decided that he wanted to approach me about doing um, an image for their cover. Um, I generally do not like commissions. This, what I've done at Princeton, Princeton, is one of very, very few commissions that I've ever done. So when they came to me and asked me to do the commission for the cover, my first reaction is, I really don't want to do that. And the reason I don't like doing that is for what I said before. I start a painting and try to leave it open as long as possible. And if the painting says go left, I go left. And if the commissioner wants me to go right, I'm going to go left because I feel obligated as a maker to do, to do just that. And so I said to them, I said, look, I'm working on another body of work that's related to this issue that you're talking about. They wanted to talk about Ferguson. Um, and I said, I said, I have this other painting that, that I think might work, but I want to be clear, to me, this is not about Ferguson. This is happening in Philadelphia, this is happening in Detroit, this is happening all over the country, so let's not editorialize this as though it's just about Ferguson. So I had started this painting because I, got, I was adopted when I was 15, that's a really long story, I'm not gonna get into that, but <laughs> um, I am still very much in touch with my mother, with my birth mother, my father, uh, now uh, my grandmother and all of this. 
My younger brother was getting into trouble uh, in Michigan in the neighborhood that we live in. And my mom called me and she said, I need you to take your brother. He needs to get out of the city. He's getting into trouble. I'm very concerned about his relationship to the police. Could you please take him for a little bit? Uh, my wife and I talked about it and said, OK. So my brother came to stay with us for a little bit. I was supposed to, as an older brother, have a conversation with him, try to keep him in line. He comes to visit our house. and. My brother and I, I love him to death, but we just don't have a whole lot in common. Like, my brother cares pretty much about two things. He cares about women and he cares about shoes. And that's all he really talks about. So after, after a couple of hours, it becomes very clear to me that this is going to be a long three days. And so, and so I, I'm trying to push. I'm trying to engage. I'm trying to get into a deeper conversation with him. Um, and it took about two days, but by day two, he started to open up. And at the end of our conversation on day two, he said, hey, I want to go, go see some of your art, which was shocking to me because he never really expressed any interest in my art because it doesn't usually have shoes in it. Um, and, so, <laughs> and so I said, OK, um, well, I have a show up in New York. Why don't we go to New York? We went to New York. Um, and we were uh, on 10th Avenue between 26th and 27th Street looking at the galleries over there, in and out of galleries. I thought we were going to be there for 10 or 15 minutes, and then he was going to want to go to Harlem and look at shoes and women, and I was like, okay. But after 20 minutes, he was still looking. I was like, great. After an hour, he was still looking and wanted to see more artwork. After two hours, he was still looking, and I was just like, this is unbelievable. This is fantastic. We're having these great conversations, and I say, okay, this is good. We're getting somewhere. Let's go. Let's go get something to eat. We'll have a conversation, and this will be my opportunity to talk to him about what mom wants me to talk to him about. We walk out of the gallery, going down 10th Avenue, between 26 and 27, and literally as I'm working up the nerve to tell him what mom wants me to say, an undercover police car skids up in front of us. Two police officers jump out of the car with their hands on their gun. They tell us to get up against the wall, and they start patting us down. Um, long story short, they accuse us of stealing artwork. I'm trying to explain that it's my artwork in the gallery. <laughs> and in fact, you couldn't fit it in your pockets if you wanted to. So I have no idea what this is about. Um, I'm getting really angry and my brother's trying to calm me down. I know how this is supposed to go. I've been in this situation before. I know the drill. But because I was taken off guard, I was off guard because I was in the moment. I was having this conversation. I didn't do what I know I'm supposed to do. And I started getting angrier and angrier and angrier. My brother has his hand on my shoulder and just like, Titus, just calm down, just calm down. So I say that to say, I probably, I probably was inappropriate. <laughs> I'll leave it at that, I was inappropriate. But when the officer gave me back my license, he said, you know, I hope you never find yourself in a situation where you need the police because we just might not be there for you. And I, I snatched my ID back and I just stomped off. And my brother said to me, see, you, you have a degree from Yale, you own your own house, you own several businesses, and they're still fucking with you. I'm back in the same neighborhood we grew up in. What am I supposed to do? And in that moment, there were, there were no words. There was nothing to be said. So when time came to me, this painting was never supposed to be about Ferguson. It's not about Ferguson. This is happening all over, whether you believe it or not. I mean, I, I really hope that, you know, and that's the only reason I tell this story, not for sympathy. Good God, I'm not looking for sympathy. I tell this story so people understand that it doesn't matter if you have on a really nice hat, which I do. Um, that's not, that is not going to stop you from being stopped. Yeah. As soon as you are old enough to look intimidating, and that's different for everybody. My 14-year-old brother was 6'1 and 200 pounds. Um, so it, 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 as soon as someone will consider you intimidating, as soon as the fear sort of boils up, that's when it begins to happen. It's that conversation. It was that conversation. What was that? Did you say that comment now? Who? <laughs> no. No. No, no. So here's the thing. Here's, here's the thing. Wait, 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 wait. That's a legitimate question. 
Don't I deserve an apology? I deserve an apology, right? Now, now, the reason I deserve an apology, and this is what this conversation is about, and this is what we don't talk about enough. The reason that this is a problem is because what this says is somehow my citizenship is less valuable than someone else's citizenship. Now, what is the impact of that idea on democracy? Why do I want to participate in a democracy that doesn't value my citizenship? So if we allow these kinds of things like these stop and frisk and all this other stuff, we are actually damaging our entire democracy. So that, I mean, that, the question that you're asking is valid. I do deserve, I do deserve an apology. And so when we think about these things, it's not just about the individual who is getting stopped. It's, that, it's this bigger picture. It's this bigger thing. And that's the reason why we have to resolve this problem. How am I supposed to react? When I, say, when I say that I know how I'm supposed to react, are there people in, in here who know what I mean by that? Okay. What it means is, from the time that you are a very young black man, either an uncle or a father or an older black man or just someone from your neighborhood will say to you, look, if you get stopped by a cop, make sure your hands are on the wheel don't, don't look around, look, look ahead, don't reach for anything, don't do it. If they stop you on the street, before they even get to you, put your hands up, right? These are people who care about you. Here's the problem. I'm not guilty of anything. I haven't done anything wrong. So why should I be walking around with this sense of fear that if a police officer stops me, I should automatically go into this defensive mode? There's no reason for that, except that I value my life. Yeah. Yep, I see you in the back. Yeah. So this, this um, painting is called uh, Yet Another Fight for Remembrance. And it's about a kind of erasure. It's about this fear, this feeling like your citizenship, your person um, is being erased and that society as a whole is really not seeing that. Now, I. I one of the things I, I, I try not to do is over describe the piece and for me that was an over description but because of the conversation that we have I, we're having right now I feel like it's necessary to do that um, what I mean by that is there there are um, ineffable mysteries that art that you make presents and if you begin to try to like tease every little piece of that out you take away some of that mystery and I want people to stand in front of the pieces, stand in front of the work, and have the experiences that they ultimately are going to have with the piece. So, um, but I want you to understand what was going on for me. Now, you may look at the piece and see something a little bit different, but that's, that's where I was with it. So the, the covering of the face right there is more about silence, being able to see what's going on, but being silenced. All right. I'm gonna keep going, that's good. Any questions about the last thing before I move on? Because we're about to jump topics. What, it, it's, um, that's one of those things, it's not, that wasn't a like, oh, this one is gonna be white. It was really just about a kind of, a kind of erasure. Honestly, it contrasts most with the black background. P purely formal, purely formal. So, in this country, we are having a lot of conversations about monuments. And I guess to a certain degree, I've kind of made my first, my first monument. But there's this weird thing that I don't get. We're not talking to artists about this. We're here talking to politicians. We're talking to you know, city councilmen. We're talking to the guy on the street. But we are not talking to artists about how to deal with these sculptures. Now, we also have this other thing that we do. We are talking about this issue of national monuments as though it's this, you know, either or, right? Either we keep the sculpture or we tear it down. Now, if you ask me if it's an either or, tear it down. Tear it down. I'm not particularly like, whatever, tear it down. And why do I say that? I say it for a bunch of reasons I'll get into in a second. But that's not the point. I don't think it has to be an either or. I really don't. I think we are, we are not thinking about a third possibility. And the reason we're not thinking about this third possibility is because we're not talking to artists. 
The third possibility is that we create, we make, we make alternatives to these sculptures. We amend these sculptures by actually, at the same way we deal with the Constitution, we bring in new sculptures to actually engage these historical sculptures. Now here, I hate to be the person to tell you this, but most of these sculptures are not made by the most interesting artists from our history, okay? I don't mean to offend anyone. They're generally pretty bad. They're often, I mean, we're not arguing about whether we're gonna move a Bernini sculpture or something like that. It's like, oh, don't touch the Elizabeth Catlett. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about these third tier sculptures by these third tier artists who were commissioned to do this stuff to push forward somebody else's political idea and they're standing there. And what I'm saying is ultimately they're not that powerful as far as art goes. Furthermore, as contemporary artists, we have an array of mediums that we can work with to address these particular sculptures, to deal with these particular sculptures. And there are so many ways in which we could do that. So my idea, this is my, like, my, big, my big dream, my big dream is that we start another WPA. And a friend of mine who, who like called me on this the other day, he was like, yeah, but the governor ain't, ain't gonna pay for that. So, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> True, very true, very true, but maybe, maybe we as citizens do. Maybe we find a way to do it privately, right? Because, because I think that at the, at the end of the day, what I'm concerned about when the sculpture goes away is not, oh, that the history will be lost. That's not what I'm concerned about. What I'm concerned about is that the process by which that sculpture was erected, that process will be forgotten. Why? Because the question is this, how? Was it ever okay to erect this in a community surrounded by people for whom that as an idea is degradation, is degrading them as, as themselves, right? We need to remember how those things take place so it doesn't happen again. Not just so we won't forget the, forget the history itself, but how those things get erected. That's important too. We have to understand that too. So my idea is if we take these new amend, these sculptures that stand as amendments and we put them in these squares, we take these guys down off of these pedestals, we put them down at eye level. We create these other arts and th these other works and they, they conceptually battle. And that those spaces become sort of a Republican forum for dialogue about the future of what we want this country to look like. Because we're not having the conversations. We're pretending like we are, but we are not having the conversations. And simply taking the sculpture down is not a conversation. It makes somebody else feel like, okay, we dealt with that. Okay, it's good, it's good. And I don't have to see this you know, crappy sculpture anymore, um, but you know, it's not actually dealing with the whole issue. I think there are some other solutions. And I think if we start talking to artists, they will, they will come up with solutions for you that will blow your mind. This is an example of one of the pieces that I made from this body of work, which I call Monumental Inversions, which in fact is on view um, over at the museum. So after this, you can, you can actually go see it. This piece was made after I took uh, my son, my two sons, Savian and Davin, to the Natural History Museum, and they saw that sculpture there in the middle. You guys know that sculpture outside of the Natural History Museum? And as, as I've said many times before, now as we're walking into the museum, my son, uh, he said, and just so you, because it's really small there, um, it's Teddy Roosevelt in the, in the middle on horseback, and then an African American on the right side and a Native American on the left side. And my, my son, my eight-year-old son at the time said, Dad, how come he gets to ride and they have to walk? <laughs> you know. If you have kids, you know, that's, that's profound, right? But if you have kids, you also understand it's pretty basic for them. That doesn't look fair. It's not fair. Like, I, I want to ride too. I want my chance to ride. And so, I mean, this is the sculpture that really, and that question from my son is really the question that got me thinking about ways in which contemporary artists can, can begin to address these issues. And this is one of the sculptures that I made in response to that. 
This is George Washington on horseback with these, with these glass vessels inserted into the cavity of the, of the horse itself. And the use of glass in these works is, you know, when you walk up to it, you kind of feel nervous. You kind of feel like it could break. It feels sort of fragile, very much like our narratives, these stories that we tell ourselves about how this country was founded. I, I'm not trying to demonize the founding fathers. I, I, it's just, it's, it's uninteresting to do that. You know, everyone is good and bad. We all have good and bad things about us. I'm not trying to demonize, but I'm also not trying to deify these people. And I think the problem is when we write these histories in the past, what has happened is these people become little gods. Um, and so we, we don't feel the freedom to fully critique them in the way that they need to be critiqued. And if we can fully critique them, then we can actually give them credit for the great things that have happened as well. But that can't happen without the full critique. So this is another example of, uh, of a piece of work from that body. This is a, you see the, there's a pillow there? That pillow is marble. And that very fragile head, which it is, it's very difficult to see from where you guys are, I imagine, is actually an impression of George Washington's face. And it's, it's sitting on top of this marble pillow, and inside there molasses, there's rum, there's lime, and there's tamarind. And I was re reading about, I was reading about um, George Washington and his particular, um, the way in which he enslaved um, people on his plantation. And there was this one individual who really captured my attention, this black man who kept running away again and again and again. And the reason why I, I, I was so fascinated with him is, you know, I, understand, I completely understand that compulsion, that idea that, yes, just do whatever you do, just get out of that situation. Finally, Washington says, look, I'm tired of chasing after this guy. You guys, anybody who's read anything about Washington knows that this man writes everything down. Like, he journals everything, which is fantastic, because we can go back and we can look at the things that he wrote. And he said, I'm, I'm tired of this guy. I don't want to deal with him anymore. So I want you to trade him to the West Indies. For what? He makes this grocery list. Molasses, rum, lime, tamarind. These are the things that he, these are the things that he wants. He trades a human being for this grocery list of things. As contemporary artists, we have the opportunity to do things and say things in a way that would have never even been considered art, you know, a couple hundred years ago. But it, it, we can do things that speak to this particular moment in a way that no one else could before, that no one else could then. And so this goes back to this idea that I was talking about with this monumental aversion thing, that if we engage artists in all of these different communities that are dealing with these sculptures and ask them, not me, I don't live in all these places, ask them, how do we address these objects in the center of your town beyond just simply tearing them down? I think we would come up with some very interesting ideas. The reason I'm here. So, this is a very difficult piece to understand visually, um, unless you're in front of it. And I love that about it. In the age of Instagram, where you take a picture of everything, it's nice that we have those moments that you just, you have to be present for. Um, I cherish all of those moments, like this, I guess, for me, even though I know some of you are recording right now. Um, when I was uh, given this commission, I knew that it fit within the context of all the other work that I had been thinking about for a very long time. And when I came onto to campus and the story was told to me about um, these black folks who were enslaved in this house, 
and then auctioned off on the front lawn, I knew that I, 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 had to make, I had to make that sculpture. I wanted to make that sculpture. I didn't, as I said to you before, I don't generally like commissions because inevitably I want to go left or the work wants to go left and somebody else wants me to do something else. But this one, just ha I just had to do it because I had been having all these conversations about public sculpture and monuments and this was the first time to actually sort of work that idea out. And so when they started telling me about those trees, those American sycamore trees that stand out front that were, that were called liberty trees, um, that these black people were, were auctioned off underneath these liberty trees, that tragic irony echoed in my head over and over again. And I wanted to find a way to address it. And then as I was standing there looking at those trees, I noticed at the top there was this, there's metal inside of the tree trying to help the tree stand up, be okay under its own weight. That this idea, that this symbol of liberty uh, was on shaky ground. And that man-made material on the inside of that tree was essential to keeping that, that object alive, that, that illusion, that symbol, I don't know, alive. And so when I started working and making sketches for this project, I knew that I wanted, I wanted the material on the inside to be some sort of a man-made material, and the material on the outside to be an organic material. And so what happens in this sculpture is, you see the silhouette of the head and shoulders there? That's, that is actually an impression. Imagine a face pressed down into the sand and pulled out, and you see the negative space that's there. And so what's interesting to me about that is it's not, and that's Finley, it's not Finley who makes the impression it's the, or makes the sculpture. It's the absence. It's the fact that he's not there, right? It's not him as an object. It's absent. And what happens when you look at this uh, sculpture, the impression itself, your brain wants to make it dimensional. It wants to pull it out. And so it tries to bring it forward in a way. And so there's this thing that happens, it goes back and forth, where it's negative or it's positive. It's negative or it's positive. And so that became essential to understanding the way in which I was gonna continue with this sculpture. This idea that that the sculpture could be at once, this character, this representation of this individual could be at once negative and positive was essential. Yep. Rodin used the same philosophy in his sculpture in Peter and the Eye. Mm -hmm. Lots of sculpture, lots of uh, sculpture, particular with the eyes, is about that removal of space and then the shadow that's created from, makes it feel like there's an actual eye there. It's, a, it's not, it's not uncommon in that way. Um, but bringing those materials together, that's the back layer. And again, that's absent, that's hollow. I wanted to find a group of people to represent the family and the other folks who were in this house, who were auctioned off in this house. And so I brought a few people together and I took a photograph of them. And that was actually a draw, I made a drawing and that was drawing was sandwiched between two pieces of glass and that was put in front of that absent space. I then put lights on the bottom to illuminate the drawing and lights on the, on the top. And then around the sides is cladded with American sycamore. So that you have this man-made material on the inside as we talked about, and then you have this American sycamore on the outside that reflects everything I've already said. And it sits right underneath those trees, yes. The man-made material is a, is a high-density foam. Um, it's about as man-made as you can possibly get. <laughs> yeah. Are you a monumental version? Mm -hmm. I work with a team and we blow it together. It's, you know, when I first decided I wanted to do this project, um, I went to a bunch of different glass blowers and they all told me that's crazy, you can't do that. You can't blow glass that big, it's just, just stop. 
we went back and forth from Seattle. We went, you know, spoke to the folks at Chihuly's place, and they're like, you know, we do big things, but we do them in small parts and put them together. And so because they kept saying it was impossible, I was like, okay, now I know I'm doing the right thing, right? <laughs> And so I, I, found, I found this crazy Australian dude who was just absolutely amazing, was like, let's do it. And, and we went in there and we got a team of six very burly guys and said, let's try it. And it was terrifying. And now I understand why they don't do it. Because there were moments where it felt like you were making a bomb and if that thing drops, it literally like, it was crazy, but it was awesome. So. Um, I, I, am, I am deeply a part of that process um, in, in the blowing. It's, it's, it's actually pretty exciting. If you haven't tried to blow glass, you really should. It's pretty awesome. Okay. Yeah. I would get to see this, this sculpture at night, but is there a transition time at twilight when the image changes from what you see uh, in the day to what you see Absolutely. And that's kind of, I mean, that's a part of the content of the work itself because we, there, in history, there are multiple narratives going on at one time. And oftentimes we just try to focus on one of those narratives. And it's, it's very difficult to, to try to focus on both of those narratives or two or three or how many ever that they are. In this sculpture, I'm trying to present multiple narratives on top of each other. And it's visually confusing, and it's supposed to be. Like, that's the point. If you go there and you're not struggling with who's in the foreground, who's in the background, then the sculpture for me is not actually working. It works because of the fact that it's a struggle to see. So at twilight, the sun begins to set, and the figures in the front um, emerge brighter, but at the same time, Finley's face um, becomes illuminated as well. The struggle becomes even more difficult at night. Yes? I was actually showing this to your granddaughter, who's biracial, and just telling her what it was, but if you were there showing this to her, what would you, how would you present it to her? Man, when little kids are around, I just listen. <laughs> I mean, because they, they really, I mean, that's what happened with my son. I generally just, I just ask them questions and try to get them talking and just say whatever comes to their head because oftentimes it leads to new work for me. Like, so I, I'm probably the wrong person to ask that because I approach it very uh, selfishly. It's like, what can I get out of this situation? That's pretty much how I approach children looking at my artwork. All right, um, this is a little bit more of a difficult transition. Um, so let's just pretend like it's gonna work. Um, so I got out of graduate school, had this amazing experience uh, in graduate school, really tough. Mel Bachner hated me. Um, and, and I got out and I was sort of thrown into the art market. Um, this whole thing right here, you guys all, listening to me, this is still new for me. This is still really strange. I was in the studio making work and nobody cared. And, and there was something really freeing about that. There was something that felt really good about just you know, making the work and it's just, you know, one day it'll get seen, but right now it's just about focusing on making the work. But I got out of school and realized that so many other artist friends of mine had the same struggle. They got out and they felt totally just thrown into the art market. You know, we, uh, we go to one of the most amazing universities, sorry, Princeton, um, for art um, in the country, and, and you don't get any conversation there about how you're supposed to survive as an artist when you get into the world. Um, you know, I understand that we don't want to be like a professional school or something like that. We don't want to damage the philosophy of art. We don't want to talk about money and art together. It feels crass. I get that. But when we're charging as much as we're charging for these students to go into the arts, we have to address it. We have to figure it out. Because do you know what's happening? Ooh, I have the transition now. Do you know what's happening? <laughs> do you know what's happening? We are segregating the arts. We are segregating the arts because it's becoming only the people who can afford it can go to these programs. They come out of, with, of school with so much debt. I've had several, particularly African-American students, who find me and say, 
You went to Yale. How did you do it? I got in, but I can't afford it, and they're not giving me enough funding. So in this, in this, um, in this stew, in this space, in this reality of folks coming out, I felt like it was important for me to try to engage this issue. And it didn't start that way. It started with me just needing a studio space. Um, I found this building, um, and I bought this building, and have begun to develop this building as an arts incubator in New Haven. I used to live in New York. I lived in New York for, for two years, and it was really great for my career. And then my second son was coming along, and I realized I am not a New Yorker. I don't want to be a New Yorker. I'm from Michigan, and I'm cool with that. I need my deindustrialized town, and New Haven <laughs> was the closest deindustrialized town to us. <laughs> and that's where we went back to. And all of my art friends were like, your career is over. I can't believe you're doing this. This is the Mecca. What's wrong with you? And to their surprise and mine a little bit too, my career wasn't actually over. In fact, my career grew. Being outside of the fray of New York and having the space to kind of take some risks and being able to rent larger space when I needed to was important for me. Furthermore, I really like my kids. I really like my wife. I wanted to be able to be close to them and create a life for them that felt important, felt like what I wanted for them, not what the art world provided for them. So we moved back to New Haven, and there's a few other artists my buddy Jonathan, who graduated the year after me, my buddy Christian, who graduated the year before me. And we are now in New Haven working on this incubator. This is the idea in a nutshell. It's a tiered mentorship program for artists, professional artists like myself, mentoring recent graduates who are coming out of Yale, RISD, wherever they're coming from, bringing them into the space and introducing them to um, a professional development program for artists that we are collaborating with Creative Capital to create, to give artists the knowledge about the business of art. So they can say either, thank you, I really needed that, and I'm out of here now, or, okay, I understand how to make this work. And then there's also a third option. I don't want to be a part of the market at all because it's kind of gross. Well, here's how you write a grant, right? These kinds of conversations, these really open conversations are what we want to have in this space. That's the first part. So it's professional artists mentoring recent graduates with a professional uh, development curriculum. The next level is the high school students. We are one block away from a high school, our building is. And that's a high school that's by and large taking out art for the students. And I, as I told you at the beginning of this, I found, the fa I found my intelligence through art. If I hadn't found art, I don't know what I would be doing. I really don't know. But it opened up so much for me. So the idea that the high school down the street doesn't have the kinds of art programs that it needs feels problematic. And I feel particularly positioned to try to do something about it. So we have those high school students come in and function as entry level studio assistants for the artists in the building. They get paid more than minimum wage to participate in that. We're partnering with Yale to fund that program. We also have a young curators program um, that we've started. Ford Foundation is funding that program where the young curators are coming in and working with more uh, advanced curators and then those young curators are actually mentoring high school students. When I look back at my career, think about Thelma Golden, I think about uh, Isolde Bremeyer, it was young black women who made my career, pretty much. Those are the ones, those are the curators who gave me a chance before anybody else would I can get a show where I want to get a show at this point. But at that point, at the beginning, no one cared. And those were the ones who took risks. And yet, if you go into the same school that's right down the street and you talk to them about curators, they don't even know that that's a thing that exists. What is a curator? That's not a part of the vocabulary. So we are actually trying to introduce curatorial practice at the level of high school and make them think, you know, hey, maybe this is something I actually want to do. There's a possibility here. We have some actually some, you know, really high level curators in the building right now, actually. So um, you're all welcome to come visit the building. Uh, our, our, we should be in the building in eight months. Um, the grand opening is in 12. Deborah Burke, the dean of the School of Architecture, has designed the building. This is sort of the like marquee 
uh, uh, spot on the building. We're really excited. There are studio spaces. There's a black box theater in the building. There's almost 20 studio spaces in the building. There's a cafe in the building. There's a co-working space in the building. We often, in schools, sort of segregate the departments. Like, writers are over here. Painters are over here. Photographers are over here. We want to make sure that we have a space for all of those um, arts to kind of intermingle. So. Um, this is, this is ultimately where my work has, has taken me. Talking about these histories in general and realizing how that past has a direct impact on the present right now. Um, and trying to find ways, trying to find things that I can do as an artist, you know, within my wheelhouse to address some of these issues. And right now, this is what I'm working on to make it happen. It's all connected. <laughs> it feels like it's not. It feels like it's all over the place. But in my mind, it's all connected. I promise you, it is. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Oh. So supposedly, uh, someone's going to come around with the microphone if you guys have, have any quick questions. Uh, I think that is the case, right? Yep. Okay. Yeah, we have uh, two microphones. You have to go. I'm not offended. Leave. <laughs> Can I shout a question? Sure. Um, I actually love the entire history of painting. Um, the painter that I look at the most, believe it or not, is Velasquez. Like, that was like, that is, as far as uh, putting paint to canvas, nobody did it better. Um, and then you've got folks, contemporary folks like Kerry James Marshall, who I'm extremely inspired by as well. And then uh, in terms of abstraction, like de Kooning for me is about as good as it gets. So, I mean, it, you can look at the whitewash paintings and see the, uh, the abstract influence. You can look at the crushed, those crumpled paintings and, um, and see where, you know, the influences that I have there. Maybe you look at the cut paintings and you think, uh, oh yeah, Fontana cut some paintings too. I mean, um, all of these things that I'm doing in my paintings are actually drawing from the entire, the entire history. Are you in one of the three museums, Yale? Yes, yeah. Uh, the Yale Art Gallery, the, this, they own that piece there, um, and they own a, a very large George Washington painting. That would have been a really good idea, actually. <laughs> uh, any other questions? Okay, yeah. Um, we're looking at your work on a screen Yep. as will most people in the yep. world, actually. Um, as a material, do you have anything to say about that? And do you work digitally? Have you thought about that? I'm so tactile. Like, I, I, like, I really, really like stuff. And the truth of the matter is I'm not as engaged with the digital world as, as, as my studio manager thinks I should be. Um, I, don't have, I don't have a Facebook page, I don't have Instagram, I don't have Twitter, I don't have any of that kind of thing, but it seems very important that this is the way that the work is getting out into the world. I just haven't figured out how to, how to resolve that yet, how I want to engage it. That said, I also make films, and so I do understand how I engage it with that medium, but as far as painting, I, don't, I, I really don't, because it's never the same. It's, not, it's never even close. I'm interested in the Ona Judge piece and how you use char. Um, I understand that it's, it's extremely emancipatory in um, its message, but there was some cognitive dissonance for me when I think about the meaning of tar and black people. And I, I just immediately thought about the, the phrase tar babies and um, just how tar was used in a very violent way also um, across history. So is it, is that something you struggled with? Is that something you thought about or anything? When I first started using the material, that's exactly how I approached it. 
I, I approached it exactly that way, and I thought that that was the extent of what the material could do. And then the material was emancipated. And the material was no longer disconnected to this negative history. And all of a sudden, I fell in love with the material itself. And that big, viscous, black stuff that was coming out of this can was just beautiful. And so I used it in that way. I felt, I, once I had that revelation, I no longer felt obligated to connect it to those particular stereotypes anymore. It didn't seem necessary, and it didn't seem like what I was trying to communicate anyway. For me, in those particular pieces that you, you saw, it's more about absence. It's more, it's more about the fact that we don't have direct depictions of many of these individuals. And it's about just this, you know, this material itself, how beautiful this material is as a stand-in for that. Yeah. Uh, Phil Yeah, yeah. So um, sometimes, uh, sometimes what happens is I just have two paintings in the studio. Um, I mean, the very first time it happened, it was it was kind of an accident, really. I had cut out a painting, not knowing what I was doing, um, and then uh, and then leaned it up against the wall, kind of frustrated about that, and saw another painting through it. And all of a sudden, like, I mean, let me just say this. Most of the artists I know, this is how it works for us. Like experimentation, you know, you, you, I, I, would, I don't want anyone to think that I sit down and calculate these ideas and they come out. That's not really how it, comes, how it works. For me, I get in the studio, I move things around, I do experiments, I throw a lot of stuff away because it doesn't work in those experiments, but the ones that do always lead to, lead to other bodies of work. I loved your talk. Thank you. Thank you for being here. My question is around these, this, this concept of inversion. Yeah. And I was just wondering, did, was there, did you have an epiphany about how you could flip something and have a whole different meaning? Or was that something that was sort of intrinsic within, with just within your being that something happened, catalyst happened, and, and boom? Because I find this inversion, just how you answered her question, plus what you've put on the canvas here, um, just so, so I find it fascinating and powerful. Sometimes when I make work, just talking through what it is, just the words reveal stuff. Um, um, so, so for example, um, behind, just the Behind the Myth of Benevolence piece, for example, that title. Um, it was working with the, the idea of this myth of benevolence. And then that was one of those situations where I put one painting on top of each other and literally just pushed the other one back like it was a curtain. Um, that began to let me know, like, this is the right direction. This is where this is supposed to go. But with those pieces, it was experiment. I made those pieces, looked at those pieces, and went, is this happening? Is this happening? Is my brain trying to tell me that this is dimensional when I know, because I made it, I know that it's not? Whoa, what is that, right? And so I figure if I'm excited about it, if I'm compelled about it, then other people are going to see it too and they're going to have some feelings as well. So, I mean, uh, I used to have a professor who used to say, you're your first audience and you need to focus on that audience first. Cool. What, what uh, is the, uh, oh, boy. Yes. <laughs> If you're going to be in the building in eight months, yeah. um, how long until you're going to take on the first of the postmasters? Good question. Very students? soon we're actually putting out, and you can go to uh, my website, and there's a link to um, postmasters' website on my website. Um, we're actually going to put out the call uh, for entries. Will that be nomination-based, or is it application? It's application-based. Okay. Application-based. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Jim. Okay, oh, sorry, yep. What's the significance of the Postmasters project, the name Postmasters? What's um, well, I don't know if I should say this here. Um, I, initially, it started off because it's the thing that you do after your, most, yeah, after your masters, right? A Postmasters. Um, but after thinking about it for a while, I realized that if we as institutions, Yales and Princetons, don't figure out something with what we're doing with graduate students in the arts, we're going to be post-masters. We're going to be after-masters programs. 
There are so many, I don't know if you heard about the school in Los Angeles where all the graduate students just walked out because they were so dissatisfied with what's happening. Um, and, I, and, and, and to me, that's not a really scary thing because the whole master's programs for art, that's new. That's new. That's not how artists were generally trained. Gen artists were generally trained by apprenticeships. One artist trained another artist. That's, that's like the history of painting. Um, that's how it happened. We got academies later and everything like that, of course. But traditionally, artists trained other artists. And I think that if we don't do something, we're going to get back to that. That said, you're not the first person to ask that question, so we're transitioning on the name right now, just so you know. <laughs> Most people are like, what does that have to do with the post office? <laughs> All right, thank you guys so much.